Welcome to the Resilient Retail Game Plan, a podcast for anyone wanting to start, grow or scale a profitable creative product business with me, Catherine Erdley. The Resilient Retail Game Plan is a podcast dedicated to one thing, breaking down the concepts and tools that I've gathered from 20 years in the retail industry and showing you how you can use them in your business. This is the real nuts and bolts of running a successful product business, broken down in an easy, accessible way. This is not a podcast about learning how to make your business look good. It's the tools and techniques that will make you and your business feel good, confidently plan, launch and manage your products, and feel in control of your sales numbers and cash flow to help you build a resilient retail business. Hello there and welcome to episode six of the Resilient Retail Game Plan. My name's Catherine Erdley and I'm your host as well as the founder of the Resilient Retail Club. The Resilient Retail Club is my membership for creative product businesses and you can find out more at resilientretail.com. This episode is all about pricing. So we have already talked about the importance of having enough profit in your business. And one of the key things that will let you get the right amount of profit in your business is to have the correct pricing. And I've said this before, but the only way that your business makes money is the difference between what you buy your products for and what you sell them for. So if you aren't selling them for enough, then you simply can't get enough money into your business. And profit is the engine that drives everything that you do. You cannot grow a long lasting business if you don't make enough money per sale, no matter how big you grow your Instagram following to be or how many sales you make. Small profit margins means making more sales each month in order to hit your income goals. The bottom line is if you don't correctly price your products, you just simply won't be able to build a really profitable, long lasting business. Think about it this way. You have a unique talent to share with the world and you can't share it on a long term basis if your business does not fulfill you in all ways, including financially. And that all starts with the pricing. What I'm going to do in this episode is I'm going to talk you through a little bit about underpricing, what it is, why it happens and how you can work out if you're doing it. Then I'm going to talk to you about something called the value triangle which is really getting you to think about the fact that people don't buy because of a price, they buy because of a value. Then I'm going to talk you through some simple steps to help you decide on your pricing. So first off, let's talk about underpricing. So underpricing is a really common issue with creative product businesses. It's charging less for your products than the market value. And it happens for a variety of different reasons. People underprice because they have a lack of belief in themselves or their business ideas. They do it because they are just not being able to see their passion as a serious business. Sometimes as well, we believe that we're helping others by undercharging. And there's also a big dollop of fear of rejection if we demand too high a price. Underpricing can be a really vicious cycle because you don't price it high enough. And sometimes that can actually lead your customer to have a negative opinion about the quality of your products. So sometimes you don't sell because the price isn't high enough. And then that leads you to get fearful about rejection and so on and so forth. As I mentioned previously, people sometimes they feel that their business is their passion. It's maybe something that they really enjoy doing, especially if it's a crafted product. And that means that they end up feeling awkward about charging the customer. But ultimately, you have to charge the customer what you need to build a really sustainable business. Otherwise, it ends up being a very expensive hobby. So if you're wondering, do you suffer from underpricing? I'm going to run through a few questions. And if you answer yes to more than one of these or several of these, then the chances are you're probably underpricing your products. So do you see other people selling similar products for much more than you and wonder how they do it? Do you avoid looking at your competitors' prices because you find it confusing or demoralizing? When you're looking at your prices, do you include your hourly rate? If it's a product that you're making, for, in other words, do you work out what you'd like to pay yourself an hour and include that time it took to produce the product into your costing calculations? Do you ever feel resentful about how little money you're making and how little you have left after paying for your products, materials, as well as your selling fees? Do you often get comments from other people about how reasonable your prices are, especially for the quality that they're getting? Are they surprised when they find out what you're charging? Do you know that your prices should be higher, but feel guilty or fearful about raising them? 
And are you struggling to meet the income goals that you've set for yourself? As I said, answering yes to a few of these statements could suggest that you really need to relook at the pricing of your products. I think guilt is a really difficult one with this. People often say, well, I don't think my customer can afford this. I want to price it in such a way that it's achievable for the customer. The trouble is, is that when you get stuck in that mentality, it's not, somebody once said to me, it's not really your business to decide whether or not someone can and can't afford something. And I do think that this is a really interesting point because Somebody else had said, I can't even remember who the right person is to attribute this quote to, but why is it that we talk about being able to afford things or people not being able to afford things? But lo and behold, when there's a new iPhone out, suddenly everybody's got the money to purchase one. Making decisions on your pricing based on what you feel people can and can't afford can get really, really sticky really quickly. You need to set the prices according to a much more logical approach, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on. The next thing that I want to talk to you about is the value triangle. As I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, even though we're talking about pricing, price or pricing is not really the key driver to somebody purchasing. Why people buy is all based around whether or not they think something is good value. For example, a Bic Biro costs about a pound. That seems like a decent value for a pen that is mass produced. That's going to be sturdy and reliable and, and keep going and you're going to be able to write things with it seems reasonable. At the same time, £65 might seem like good value for a hand-turned wooden fountain pen, for example. So again, it's not really to do with the price. It's not saying that people will only pay X amount of money for a pen. It's really to do with how people perceive the value. The value triangle has three elements to it. You have desirability, price, and quality. So those three elements together Desirability, price and quality really make up whether or not somebody thinks that the product is good value. For example, quality. Let's start with quality. If you deserve to charge more, then you should charge more, but you have to explain why. So customers will pay more for your products if they believe something is of higher quality. Don't be afraid to charge what something is worth. If it's a premium product, you need to charge premium prices. If you've sourced the very best materials, then you need to charge for them. If you are having the product manufactured in a way that is premium because it's small batch production or it's being handmade or you yourself are making it, these are all reasons for you to see your product as high quality and to charge accordingly. The catch here is that you have to explain why. So if you imagine that there are two bags up on the internet, it's just a picture of a bag. One is £19 and one is £250. If all you could see was that picture and the two prices, then you don't really have much to go on. And you might be asking yourself why one is so much more expensive than the other. But if you had a description and one said that it was £19, it was made in China, that it was made from nylon, it was mass produced, you would suddenly get an understanding of, okay, this is a mass produced item that has been made overseas, that the quality, maybe it's not going to be that great. You start making assumptions about it and the price starts to make more sense. But then the other bag that's £249, if there's a product description there and it talks about the leather, how this is premium leather that was hand finished in Italy, (laughs) where the bag was sewn by hand from a small atelier that makes bags for all of the fashion labels and that the metal pull on the zip was cast especially for you. There's all kinds of things that you can kind of wax lyrical about the beauty of the bag and how it's made and it's maybe it's lined with vintage fabric and so on and so forth. So you can see that what then starts to come into play once you start getting into the detail of the quality of the product, then the price starts to make more sense. You've got to think about it a little bit like seduction, especially if it's a higher priced product. You've got to really sell it. You've got to really explain to the customer why it's so special. You've got to give them the benefit of all of the information that you have about the product. I'm willing to bet that if you're listening to this podcast and you have a creative product business, 
You started this creative product business because you're really, really passionate about the products that you produce. And therefore, the products that you produce are probably really high quality. They're probably sourced in a way that is extremely well thought out, that you've been really careful about where you're getting the components from, who's making it. You've put time and effort into thinking about the design. You've really drilled down into what you're trying to achieve. But if you don't share that with a customer, they're just going to see the fact that the price is higher. Because I'm also willing to bet that if you're listening to this and you have a creative product business, you're not going to be competing on price. You're not going to be trying to get in there and get in at a lower price than anybody else. You're probably going to be competing on the desirability and the quality of your products. You have to explain why something is worth more. Think about if it's a handmade product or a small batch production, then show behind the scenes, show the process used to make something. Make sure when you're talking about the quality, though, you have to think about it from the customer's perspective. If they won't understand the value of an element of your product, you've either got to educate them or price accordingly. I'll give you a couple of examples of what I mean by this. So first of all, If you think about printing, if you're talking about a screen printed item, as opposed to a digitally printed item, that is a single color costs less than five color print and so on and so forth. But if you said to a customer, I'm charging you more for this because it's got more colors, most customers don't really get that. They wouldn't really understand why they're paying extra for the fact that something's got more colors in it than something else. So here are your choices. You can either charge the same for your prints, no matter how many colors they've got on them. Or you can explain to your customer about the printmaking process. You can show screens, how they work, how the different layers of color are applied and how the process of printing multiple colors is more involved and more labor intensive and therefore more expensive. So you either have to, as I said, those are your two choices. You leave the price the same, no matter how many colors, or you actually explain the process. And this is one example, but it's true for pretty much anything else. So for example, another clothing example is that certain stitches cost more money in production than other stitches. So again, because most people don't have a really strong grasp of garment production, if you say to them, oh yes, well that one's 10 pounds more expensive because it has pick stitch, then most people just aren't going to get that. So again, your choices are don't increase your prices because of it's a technique that the customer doesn't understand or get into the technique and really explain to the customer why it's more expensive. Create videos, create web copy, create all kinds of information that you can share with your customer, really get to grips with why something is more expensive than something else. Okay, so now let's talk about desirability. So if you remember, we're talking about the value triangle, which has three elements, desirability, price, quality. So we talked through quality. If you deserve more, charge more, but you always have to explain why. And now we're going to talk about desirability. Now, again, I have touched on this in previous podcasts. I've talked about products that sell. So this isn't a new concept if you've been listening to the whole series But desirability does really have an impact on the price. It's the most subjective of all the elements that make up the value. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you can charge vastly more for a product that's desirable, but it definitely creates what is known as price elasticity. In other words, somebody might say, well, normally I pay around £30 for a top, but I just saw this one and I loved it, so I spent a bit more. We've all had the moment where we've walked into a shop and seen something that we don't need, but we must have. So it's a very powerful force in the buying process and the customer's psychological journey when it comes to purchasing something. If you can produce that feeling in your ideal customer, then you can stretch your prices that little bit higher. People want what they want. And we've all had that moment. As I said, you've probably seen something and thought, oh, wow, that's amazing. If it's I don't know, if it's under £50, maybe I'll buy it. But you haven't got into the nitty gritty about, well, that's £25. And the other one that I saw was 22 You know, if you really love something, then you will be willing to open up your wallet and actually purchase it. 
What does that mean, desirability? Well, again, it's a really hard one to pinpoint. A lot of it is about really knowing your customer. It's about creating a product that's irresistible to them. Sometimes it's also about creating a buzz around a product. So for example, I did a workshop this morning with Elizabeth Stiles, fashion brand consultant, and we talked about the importance of launching products and the importance of having this hype around your products. So people either want the product because they see it and it just perfectly fits exactly what they want. And sometimes they want it because there's a bit of a buzz around it. I call this the Beanie Baby effect. So Beanie Babies that were really big in the late 90s, people just wanted them. They just wanted to collect them. They wanted to grab them. I worked in a shop and people would grab them off the shelf as soon as I put them on the shelf. And it was because everybody had them. It was, you know, a real trend. People just felt like there was something going on. They saw other people grabbing at them and they felt like they had to have it. And Daniel Priestley, who writes some fantastic books, including one called Unsubscribed, which I highly recommend, talks about how people don't want what they need. They want what other people have. So sometimes desirability is something that you can maneuver the customer into. So if you're having a launch, if you're having a restricted amount of product that you're creating, a limited edition, you're creating that fear of missing out in your customer. Again, they're not going to stop to ask the price if they're so excited that they actually got their hands on your product. So pre-ordering can work like this, where you're opening your orders for a certain amount of time and you're telling customers, right, if you want this product, you have to order right now, or you put people on a waiting list, or you just hype up a launch and you explain to them that there's really only limited quantities and they're selling out. If people get excited enough about your product and are really feeling it and are really feeling like this is something I absolutely have to have then they are not going to be looking as closely at the price tag when it comes to purchasing. And as I said, it doesn't mean that you can charge double what you might have otherwise charged necessarily, but it does mean that you've got that price elasticity where people aren't really thinking about it quite so much. They're just thinking about how they've got to get their hands on your product. So of course, then price is the other element of the value triangle, but you'll see that it's only one element of it. It's not the whole thing. People look at the price, they compare it to the quality and they compare it to how much they want it. And then they make a decision as to whether or not they think that's good value. So here are a few examples of how price quality and desirability can work together in the retail industry. So for example, luxury goods, quality has to be excellent. The product has to be desirable and then the price can be premium. In commodity, so I always think about school uniform when it comes down to this because I think it's the ultimate example of commodity. So the quality has to be acceptable. I mean, that's the thing about quality. It can never be below acceptable. It's only ever acceptable or premium or I'm thinking about it like airlines, like acceptable, premium, either can be economy, premium economy, business class or first class when it comes to quality. You can't have an unacceptable quality and actually sell a product. So when you think about a commodity product like school uniform, then the quality is acceptable. The product is basic and it's not desirable. So then it's all about the price. So if you see school uniform at back to school time, then the prices are just eye-wateringly low. They are a couple of pounds for shirts sometimes in Asda or some of the bigger shops. And that's because this is a commodity product and it is all about competing therefore on the price. There's nothing else, no other hook that they can hang their pricing on. Although even that said, I have noticed that even with a commodity product like this, then some businesses have worked out that you still need that element of desirability. So for example, I have a 10 year old daughter and last year, all of her school dresses, I got talked into buying the ones that had little unicorn heads on the zip pulls. So even in commodity, people are experimenting with the ways that they can make the product more desirable for the target customer. Fast fashion. So obviously fast fashion is very problematic. I'm not going to get into a discussion about fast fashion, but what I just want to touch on is that the way that fast fashion worked is interesting when you look at the price, desirability, quality, value triangle. The quality, again, is acceptable. It's definitely not premium, but the product style is appealing and there's the desirability that has really driven fast fashion. And that's been about them being able to interpret catwalk trends really quickly, being able to work with influencers so people see the product on 
celebrities and want to purchase it. So they have worked on that desirability, which meant that very basic products like t-shirts or very basic cut and sew knits, for example, they've been able to elevate them slightly in that desirability stakes. And therefore the prices, they're still competitive, but they're slightly higher than those commodity prices. Now, of course, it's going to be interesting. I did say I wasn't going to get onto a whole discussion about fast fashion, but it will be interesting to see where now that fast fashion is seen as less desirable, but just by the nature of its production and all of the associated problems that we are now more aware of, then it'll be interesting to see what happens with that value triangle. But that's really how the basic model works, if you like, for fast fashion, is they're relying on that desirability to get people to purchase. The bottom line is, if you're struggling to get the price that you know that your product deserves, then ask yourself, are you doing enough to communicate your quality And is your style appealing enough to your customers? I can't tell you the number of times I have a discussion with somebody and they tell me that sales have maybe been a little bit tricky and what they think they need to be doing is dropping their prices to get more people to buy. But I feel very nervous about this approach because in my experience, unless your pricing is completely wrong, unless you've just misread the market, unless you've just put the prices in at totally the wrong end of the spectrum, the chances are your prices are absolutely fine. It's a question of whether or not you've actually done a good enough job conveying that quality to the customer. And another question that you have to ask yourself is, are these products desirable enough for my customer? It's not an easy question to ask yourself. It's not an easy question to have to answer because of course, We all try our hardest with our products and we feel really passionate about them. But I would just challenge you that if you feel like you've got a problem with your pricing, you feel like your prices are too high, just ask yourself that simple question. Are other people able to sell at this price? Is it really the pricing or is it actually to do with another element of the value triangle? Are my customers convinced that this is a good value and that this is worth buying? It's also worth thinking about How do brands communicate value with and without words? So photography can play a really big part in this as well. If you are, for example, struggling with your sales and you think that it may be to do with with your pricing, that your pricing is too high, again, exactly as I just said, you know, but you're able to see that other brands are selling at a higher price. Again, ask yourself, how are they communicating that value with and without words? How are they describing the process? Are they sharing behind the scenes footage of it? Are they getting into real detail about the different elements, how they're all pulled together, where they come from? Are they sharing the story? Are they sharing the value? Are they sharing the brand ethos? Are they sharing all the work that they've put into making these products? Are they basically really selling the value of these products to their customers? Is it that they're using words? Is it that they're using imagery? How does their branding look? Does their branding look premium? Does their imagery really show the products off? Does it feel like quality when you look at the images? And how do yours stack up? Again, it's not an easy question to ask yourself, but ultimately, if you are going to produce a product that is really high value, really premium for your customer, then you need to market it in that way as well. You need to make sure that your branding reflects that, your packaging reflects that, and even the tone of voice of your business. So again, your packaging doesn't have to be hugely elaborate. I think we're really moving away from needing to have these kind of big glossy boxes. In fact, I think that's actually really against what a lot of customers want. They want to see minimal waste. But just thinking about how does that experience feel to the customer when they receive something from you? Do they feel like they've got something that is really great value? Just want to take a moment as well to talk about customer feedback on pricing, because this is one of the things I also find is a problem. When people tell me that they think their products are too expensive, I'll ask them, you know, what evidence do you have for that? You know, why do you think that your why do you think that your prices are too high? And usually what it comes down to is that somebody somewhere at some point has made a comment to them about their prices, a negative comment, and it's really stung them. So people will say, well, I went to this craft fair and I got feedback that the product was too expensive, or I went to this event, or I was put something up on Instagram and I got feedback the product was too expensive. And then usually I'll dig a bit deeper and say, well, who was it who told you that? Or how many, okay, so how many customers gave you that feedback? And quite often it ends up being one person So because a lot of underpricing can stem from our beliefs about money, our beliefs about value, us having self-confidence in ourselves as entrepreneurs, 
it is sometimes a case of it doesn't take much to knock that confidence. So it doesn't take much for somebody to turn around and say, actually, that's oh, that's so expensive. I, I can't believe you're charging this. I could have gone to, you know, Asda and got this for I could have got this baby grow for three pounds. There's always going to be somebody who does that. I'm convinced there's somebody who walks into Primark and says, oh, I can't believe you get away with charging two pounds for that swimsuit or something ridiculous. So there's always going to be somebody who tells you you're too expensive. The trouble is, is if you're worried about being overpriced anyway, you could have a hundred happy customers who are very happy to pay the full price for your product and delighted and actually think that they've got a really great deal. And then one person will come along and tell you that they think you're expensive. And all of a sudden, it's like that balloon can pop and you can feel really deflated. So if that sounds familiar, if that's resonating with you, then I would suggest that you definitely think about your pricing in the most logical way possible. And also just ask yourself when you get that kind of feedback, is this really my ideal customer? Is this the customer that I really think I've got for my products or is this just somebody who likes to complain? And I'm willing to guess if they're the kind of person who's frankly rude enough to say something like that to somebody about their pricing, then they're probably not your ideal customer. So we've talked a lot then about the importance of getting your prices right. We've talked about the different elements of the price value triangle. We've talked about how you can convey the quality and the value of your products through words and also pictorial or non-verbal ways. And now what I want to go on and talk about is how do you actually go about setting your prices? So as I said, I know that this is a tricky subject and people get really, really stuck on their pricing. But I think the best antidote to all of your feelings of discomfort and difficulty around pricing and knowing whether or not you can charge the full amount for your products because you made it as opposed to somebody else, then I would say the, the antidote is really to be as logical as possible. If you find it hard to be logical by yourself, get somebody in who doesn't really know your business, preferably someone who would be an ideal customer, maybe somebody you know, but they don't know all the ins and outs of your business and ask them to help you because it will help you get that external view as well. Sometimes we end up so close to our products that we just can't get the objective view. We just can't pull back far enough to really take a look at it and to understand our products the way that our customer sees our products. It's almost impossible to, to really get that objective view when you're so close to it. So here are the steps that I would use and I suggest that you use to decide your prices. First thing is you want to figure out who your closest competitors are. When I say closest competitors, I don't mean people who manufacture it in a completely different way to you. So if you are a small batch production business or handmade, find three people who make approximately the same way that you do at approximately the same quality level. Don't worry too much about aesthetics right now. So for example, if you make leather goods and yours are very pared back and minimalist, but they are handmade from high quality Italian leather. And you know that there's another brand that does high quality Italian leather handmade goods, but they're all very neon and bright and not the same customer as you at all. That's fine. You can still use them for price benchmarking. Aesthetic is less important at this point, unless the aesthetic has a lot to do with the pricing. So for example, heavily embellished versus very plain will have a different pricing structure. So to reiterate then, you want to find three close competitors who have a similar method of production and a similar quality of products. Once you've found those three, then you can start deciding on what's your price position compared to them. So price position means, are you the same price as them, which is basically in line with them? Are you premium? So even if you're there, your closest competitors, are there elements about your business that you feel make you actually superior, or maybe superior is the wrong word, but more premium than they are, in which case you might want to price higher. So for example, you both hand make products, you both use high quality components, but then yours are assembled in the UK and theirs are assembled in a larger factory, for example, or yours are organic and theirs are not, or some other element that would basically mean that they're close to you, but you you still feel that there's an element to which yours are more premium. You might also decide that actually you're going to be all about value, a value proposition, which basically means you're slightly lower priced than them. 
So you're going to use them as your guide, but it doesn't mean you have to be priced the same as them. But again, if you are going to be higher priced than them, make sure that you're going to be able to explain to the customer exactly why. You don't have to name your competitors, but you've got to be able to articulate the value and the premium nature of your product. So that's number one, find your competitors. Number two, decide on your price position as it compares to them. Number three, survey your customers. Make sure that you don't ask them, would you pay £20 for this? But you ask them the last five times that you bought an item, how much did you pay? It's much better to ask about past buying history than it is to actually go ahead and ask them, would you buy this? Because most people want to be aspirational. They don't want to say, no, actually, I wouldn't pay £20 for that. And also, they're probably trying to be nice. So if you say to them, would you pay £20? They'll probably all say, oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Whereas if you say to them, okay, but the last five times that you bought something, how much did you pay? It'll give you a much clearer answer. Also worth asking them. So let's say it's a T-shirt. You say to them, how much did you pay the last time you bought a T-shirt? Definitely ask them, how much did you pay last time you bought one as a gift or as a special treat? Because again, as product businesses, small independent product businesses, you're very unlikely to be trying to compete on price. You're going to be trying to compete on having those special products, which people will typically buy for gifts or maybe for themselves as a treat. So it's worth asking about that when it comes to the past purchasing behavior. And then you want to work out from that what you're going to price your items. Make sure that it looks logical. So make sure that your products look logical against each other, if that makes sense. So if you've got a short sleeve t-shirt that's £29 and a long sleeve that's 25 that doesn't make a lot of sense. So make sure that you could have somebody who doesn't know your business explain to you why one product is more expensive than another. It should be pretty self-explanatory. And if you're not sure about that, again, pull in somebody who's not that close to the detail and just ask them, which one do you think is more expensive and is it obvious? And then once you've done all that, you can check the profitability. Now, you might be wondering why, since I love to bang on about profitability so much, that I actually mention it as the very last step when it comes to setting your prices. And the reason that I mention it as the very last step is because I really believe that you have to price your products according to your market. Sometimes people will be told, okay, you need to take a cost price and multiply it by four and that's your retail price and that way you make sure you're making enough profit. Trouble with that is you just simply don't have any reason to, there's no logic to base that number on. If you've just taken your cost price and times by four, what if it told you that your top had to be 120 pounds, but nobody was going to buy that for 120 pounds? It's, It's not a bad way to just do a bit of a sense check to make sure that the pricing looks okay for your profit, but it's much better to actually do the logical steps first. Look at your competitors, your closest competitors, ask your customer about their previous purchasing habits and how much they spent, and then look at designing your prices and then check the profitability because you've started with the most important thing, which is the market and the customer. You've picked your prices based on what you believe people will actually pay, and that's the most important thing. And so there you have it. Pricing is absolutely critical for your business. It's something that you need to get a handle on. It's not the easiest topic at all, because as I said, people are very prone to underpricing when they first start out and they really struggle sometimes to get that kind of logical view. If you're feeling like you need any more support with your pricing, then I do have an entire pricing course called How to Profitably Price Your Products. Try saying that three times fast. That's available to the members of the Resilient Retail Club. So if you're interested in that at all, then definitely check out resilientretail.com. And that's it from me. I'd love to hear how you found the episode. Did it ring any bells for you? Do you feel like you're under pricing? Did that uh, resonate at all? How do you find setting the prices? Do you find that now, if you've been going for a while, do you find it a little bit easier? Was it something you struggled with at the beginning, but you find easier now, or do you still find it hard? I'd love to know. Why not send me a DM on Instagram? I'm at Future Retail UK. I'm always happy to hear from people who've been listening to the podcast, find out what your main takeaway is. Or you can hop into my free Facebook group, which is called Female Founders in Retail, and share your takeaways there. If you've enjoyed this episode, it would mean so, so much to me if you would rate and review it. And of course, don't forget to subscribe so that you can make sure you can hear all of the new episodes as they're released. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, then I invite you to check out resilientretail.com. 
The Resilient Retail Club is the membership for anyone wanting to start, grow or scale a profitable product business. No more trawling Google trying to find the answers to your questions or wading through general business advice that speaks mainly to service-based businesses. Whether you're still at the idea stage or you've been going for a while, but want to get more focused and organized when it comes to your business, with a library of courses tailored to creative product businesses, several live sessions a month, and a supportive and active community, the Resilient Retail Club is the perfect membership to help you hit your goals faster. Check it out at resilientretail.com.